folks, and welcome or welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima, I'm again, and this podcast was brought to you, among others, by Emil Gorgis, a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian. He's been living here in Japan for the past two decades, eight years of which he's been actively buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in the city, on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So his company has a dedicated loan officer in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts panel sessions. So you're probably already aware that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or if you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, drop him a line on emil.gorgis, that's E-M-I-L dot G O R G double E S Emil dot Gorgies at Tokyo Realty dot JP. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, so we're back with our JREP panel this week, or at least most of it. And this time we talk a bit more about those dirt cheap ski resort properties. Who can use those and for what purposes? how to do due diligence on them, how do renovations and repairs work there, uh, from which we segue into the broader topic of reserve funds for renovations and repairs, the difference in mentality and mindset between buildings and areas that are mostly investor-owned versus mostly owner-occupied owned, shopping streets or shutengais as they're called here, and also a bit about loans. So multiple loans, how exactly is uh, borrowing and repayment capacity calculated, how are interest rates calculated, and the factors that affect all of that. So the age of the borrower, their family status, length and type of employment, monthly annual income and so forth, existing debt as well. And then at the very end, we talk about our new company, Nippon Bridge and the services that it offers, which is to help foreign investors buy into and operate Japanese franchise businesses. And also we're going to be providing affordable relocation support services. I've mentioned this a few times in the past already, and you can soon expect to hear a lot more about it. But for now, just giving you a sneak preview of what we're all about. So really good discussion there. Hope you enjoy it. And I'll see you again on the other side. And we're back. Japan Real Estate Experts Panel, JREP. Um, hey, guys. Hello. Did you miss us? Well, but by the time we publish this, it might be like three of them just just prior to that, so they're not even going to know how long we haven't been uh, we haven't been getting together. Oh, has it been? I think last week I couldn't come on. Um, maybe the week before or the week before that. Yeah, no, but I published them a couple of months later, and then I squeeze other episodes in between, so it takes a bit of time. So yeah, short short intros, Tracy. So yes, I'm Tracy. I am the Minpaku short-term rental expert. Um, I've been doing short-term rentals in Tokyo for 10 years and I have a Minpaku Kandi license and also I have a hotel license and I have various house licenses. So I'm property manager. I look after people's properties who are living overseas, for example, um, or investments. So that's me. Emil? Ziv, yourself. Oh, okay. Me? Okay. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Ziv. Yep. Um, so I'm Ziv. I'm a co-founding partner and I've been running Nippon Tradings International for the last 10 years as well. And what we do is uh, we help um, investors and holiday home shoppers uh, mainly, but basically anyone who wants to buy any kind of real estate in Japan, we help them research, due diligence, negotiate, purchase, manage and sell their properties. Um, whether they're in Japan or without. So our thing is we can do everything for people, uh, for them to be completely remote if they want, or they can hire us for just research, consultation, and facilitation of the purchase, and then they can manage on their own anything that they want. Emil. Sure. And I'm a real estate agent here uh, based in Tokyo. Um, I help usually to English-speaking or foreign families uh, that are long-term residents in Japan uh, purchase their first home. So we do the very standard, you know, 
Japanese home loans, the you know, 100% financing or 105% financing at you know 0.5% interest rate um, for your personal home in in Tokyo. Um, yeah, my, so my most recent clients, um, they are about four months, I think four months pregnant, um, and they just bought a brand new house Asian. out in uh, yeah, uh, where where is it? Um, oh, geez, still going. Um, near Tamagawa area. So yeah, they bought a brand new house. Um, it should be completed uh, April, and they'll be moving in early May. May you 9th, just bought a new house. Settlement day. You oh just... no, no, sorry, not me. My clients, my clients. Oh right. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. This is, yeah, no, no. So my, my my most recent clients are um, yeah, it's a married couple, and they are four months pregnant. Oh right, so they, okay. So, so they need to yeah move a bit quickly. <laughs> um, pregnant couple. So it's a Japanese wife with an English husband. Uh, Tamagawa. Uh, good yeah, then near that side of town. Nice. Yeah. Uh, you, nice. Uh, you mentioned first house, but I'm guessing people come to you for uh, upgrade on their house to sell an old one. Oh, yeah. well, yeah. So the, actually, well, <laughs> it's funny. So the the two active ones I have right now, like last week, uh, one is that young family who are you know six months uh oh sorry uh, four months pregnant and the other one is um he's a gentleman who bought a, a mansion like an apartment so a mansion um in uh setagaya kuni sangin uh about three years ago 2019 he bought it and since then he's got he got married a little bit after, like maybe a year afterwards or two years after he got married and just uh a few months ago he sent me another message saying look you know we're outgrowing our two ldk mansion and we've got a few dogs now as well we've got three little dogs we need a house we need a, a bigger place so we're, we're looking around and um and they're they're, they're both uh, a foreign couple um neither are japanese but the husband has a permanent residency and yes yeah, so we looked at some places and we just found a uh a house for them as well down near sort of towards the tamagawa area like it's in uh not set the uh just near Setagayaku, um, the, the next one, uh, 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 Komaya, Komaya Ward, Komayashi. Uh, it's a, it's a used, house, used property, but it's, it's fantastic. It's, uh, 10, it's 10 years old. It's made by a uh, Hable house, which is a steel structure. It's a brand name, um, order, order made house, steel structure. So the roof can be flat. It doesn't need the triangle roof. So the whole top, the whole rooftop, the whole top is a, is a rooftop. And it has a garden and like a double car park driveway. Um, great for their dogs. So it's it's fantastic. So we just put the offer in it and it got accepted. And now we're doing all the bank paperwork. So yeah, uh, you, and we're in the process of selling. Now we're going to start selling his previous, his original, his first mansion. Um, so yeah, in terms of what you mentioned, upgrade. Yeah, we're doing that right now. Just people upgrading in their next stage of life. Uh, so we're doing that. So yeah, we do that. When you do these kind of deals, you usually get two for the price of one kind of thing, right? Because like you said, they need to sell the old house too. Yeah, um, to be honest, um, no, so yes, that is the case, but they don't always sell it. Sometimes I'll rent it out depending on their situation. So yeah, we can also manage the full rental um, rental management of it. And generally, we try to do that. Um, we don't make as much money. We make more commission on sale than rental management. Yeah, of course. But, you know, we... I personally genu- genuinely believe if you can keep your old one as an investment and rent it out and you still have enough borrowing capacity to to keep your uh, to buy a second one the the rental you get on the first property will more than pay will more than cover the mortgage so why should you get rid of that um, so that that's the ideal scenario for the clients and we like doing that because it's not about how much money we can get it's what's the best what's the best situation um the the client can be in the most comfortable and most financially beneficial uh and but in his case uh he doesn't want to like he can't borrow as much he only bought it three years ago right so basically he hasn't paid off enough of it to extend out an extra loan for the new property and the new property is substantially more because his situation has changed his family size has grown um so he needs a bigger more expensive place so he has to get rid of the the uh, the first one what, so I, I have two questions. I have two follow-up mm-hmm. questions to this. First of all, if you have, like, mm-hmm. you know, if you do have an existing property, how what's the usual amount of um, principal that you will have had to have paid off before they'll, like, extend the loan? Or does that not work like that? Uh, it doesn't work like that. But it, it's a good question. Um, 
So rather, how does a second loan work? If you have one, a second how much house, do they loan? Yeah, second house loan or just extending. How much, how much can you borrow if you've already got an existing loan? And it's actually quite straightforward. What they look at is uh, how much can you borrow in total based on your income? Right. What is your, your total balance? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, up until, it doesn't really matter until 45 years old. Yeah, I'm, so, 50, I'm, I'm 50, right? We're all, we're all yeah. older than 45. Well, well yeah. So, and that's, when I say it doesn't matter, it's just a, quite a mathematical calculation. The loan, in, in general, when we say that, like, the numbers I'm going to give you, it's based on a 35-year loan term. So for the most part, you can borrow about seven to eight times your annual income based on a 35-year loan. Mm -hmm. Okay? Once you... Uh, but the condition is the maximum is 35 years or it must be paid off by your 80th birthday. Right. So once you turn 45, the loan term can only be 34 years, 33 years, 32 as you get older. So, but how they calculate the max borrowing amount, I say seven, seven times your annual income, but it's actually, you shouldn't repay annually more than one third of your, of your income to the mortgage. Beyond that, they think you're going to be in financial stress. Okay? So let's say the most you can borrow is um, based on a 200,000 yen mortgage repayment. Okay? If you can pay 200,000 yen a month, the bank thinks 200,000 yen a month is the most you can pay comfortably without being in financial stress. 200,000 yen based on the current interest rates over 35 years for 420 repayment periods, 420 months, is... Uh, about uh, 70 million yen, nana yen. Mm -hmm. Comes to about 200,000 yen a month. Now, if you're you know, 49 years old or 50 years old, you've only got, you can only do a 30 year mortgage repayment. Your borrowing capacity, your repayment capacity is still 200,000 yen a month. But 200,000 yen a month, no longer over 35 years, only over 30 years. So that's not as much. And that's how they look at it. Okay, it. it's based on your repayment. So if you have another loan, let, so a, a good example, let's forget about another house loan. Let's look at a car loan. You have another car loan. Even if it's a three-year car loan, if you're paying 50,000 yen a month for that car loan, the bank will say the most you can pay per month is 200,000 yen. Less than but, you already have, but you already have a 50,000 yen monthly obligation. Mm -hmm. So we're going to loan you based on 150,000 yen repayment for the 35 years. Mm -hmm. And you say, hey, my car is only 3 million yen. I'm only, like, it's not going to be paid off in three years. We'll say, yeah, but we're looking at your current monthly obligations. So if you want, pay that loan off. Pay that, pay that car loan off. And then all of a sudden, your obligations will, you know, are, are wiped. And you can uh, now borrow based on um, 200,000 yen uh, annual repayments. So now when you look at, and this is relevant because to your question before was how much principal do you have to have paid down? Mm -hmm. it, that, that, that's, the wrong, that's the wrong way of looking at it. Let's say you have a, you bought a 50 million yen property and you only have, and it's, uh, sorry, uh, I'll stick with 70 million. A 70 million yen property, you're paying 200,000 yen a month. Maybe there's only five years left in the loan term. You bought it 30 years ago. There's only five years left. And so there's only, you know, 6 million yen, 7 million yen left in mortgage repayments mm -hmm. on your 70 million yen property. There's just, there's not much left. But your monthly obligations are still 200,000 yen a month. Your monthly outgoing is based on a 70 million yen loan, even though there's not that much being borrowed from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the bank is going to say, well, you're currently paying off a 70 million yen equivalent mortgage. So you, you're already fully extended. So as long as you're paying those 200,000 yen a month, you can't borrow more because you can't repay more. Precisely. Okay. Um, so what, depending on how long you've had it, so it's not how long is, sorry, it's not how long is, rem, not how much is remaining of the balance that you need to pay. It's what's the monthly outgoings. That's why a car loan um, or other kind of short-term loans that you're, uh, a car, again, is a good example because if you're paying 50,000 yen a month for the car loan, even if it's just a 3 million yen car or 4 million yen car, it's going to impact your mortgage, your borrowing capacity by about 30 million yen. So $300,000, right, is less than what you can borrow. So it... it 
Well, we've lost him. Hold on. So, yeah. Um... Oh, we've, oh, he's completely gone. Not with us. Not with us. Well, I have another follow-up question for him. He's been um, telling too many state secrets. They cut him off. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have a question for you. I'm, full que I'm the question ghost there. Go for um, it. And um, we'll, let, we'll let him in when he comes back in. But um, so my question to you, so, uh, my question is, I've been, I've been sniffing around these um, uh, ski village places again, Ziv. I keep, I keep looking at them. And um, I don't know, what is your, uh, you know, the, the people that I've been talking to, the, the management company, was basically saying if you buy it as a company, and I have a company, um, yes, so we'll come back to you in a minute, Emil. Um, if, we, if I buy it as a company, then even though I can't list it on Airbnb, they still tell me that I'll be able to list it, uh, sorry, have other people visit in, in terms of like a, a membership club or a private members club. It's really dependent on the resort. So all of these properties that you're looking at most likely, um, even if they're separate, like standalone villas, they're most likely within resort grounds. Correct. Yes. And there's a, there's a fairly, there's a fairly hefty candy here and, and a fairly, yeah. but, but there are some, you know, there is some common, you know, there's some common things that you can use. There's like yeah. a, like a bath and there's a, you know, a ski lockers and all sorts of things that are. Yeah. So common. it really depends on the resort. All of them are generally very anti-rentals. Like if you actually want to rent it out, um, it's always, almost always going to be a strict no. But some of them do allow your personal friends and family uh, acquaintances to use the property, even if you're not there. Well, they said, they said to me that they were, what, they were okay with having a, uh, like a private members club. So if you were, if you had, a, because if you buy it as a company, then you can let other company, you know, wouldn't, it, they didn't say staff, it was a, it was a club. And it's like, you can have a, club members can come and use it. And I was like, okay, I mean, that I'll just list it on my website and I'll have my clients book it. I mean, pay for, I, I mean, I, I, they, I don't want, they don't want it listed on an Airbnb. I get that. You're not yeah. going to get a Minpaku license. Yeah. I haven't heard about this particular way of putting it, but I think it's a kind of a workaround that they found out, right? So if I'm an individual owner of one of these properties and I can let my friends and family, well, if I'm a company owner, then I can let members of my company use it, you know, staffers, club members, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, um, I'll, look in, I'll look into that some more because if that's the case, I can, I'm actually keen to, you know, for my own weekend or and for my own stuff as well. But if I can make that a cost, not a cost center, it wouldn't be so much of a profit center either. It would be more of a lifestyle profit center. Uh, like pay for itself kind of thing. Pay for itself type of thing. And I recognize there's going to be no capital gain. And there's, you know, because there is a fairly hefty can be here. Um, yeah. You know, you're my aunt, like, you know, 40,000. 300 bucks Ooh. or 40,000. Okay. 40,000 a month. But, you know, like I said, there's, there's a nice bath, like, you know, they've got to use, and I don't know the other things to consider, like, you know, the body corporate things that I'll have to do some due diligence on, you know, what, well, just bear in what, mind, uh, what repairs needs things, to be doing. Two things you want to look at. Number one, um, agents are agents, right? So, I mean, Emil and people like him, notwithstanding, most of the agents will say that it's doable, even if it's theoretically doable, just to make the sale. This was this was not the this was the canby. This was the if this was the canby, not a problem. So that's that's what I was going to yeah. say. As long as as long as you get information directly from the canby saying that that's doable, then that's doable. I mean, they're the ones calling the shots. It wasn't it wasn't a real estate agent because I was actually going to go and hire you to then broker the sale for me because I just <laughs> you know. yeah. So that's that's definitely doable. If the canby says it's okay, then it's okay. I mean, look, the owners might vote in the future to change that, but at the moment, it's doable. Okay. The other oh, thing is to um, the same sort of due diligence that you're going to be doing on any kind of property uh, that's managed by a country, you want to do on this one as well. So you want to see how much they've, because they're collecting, like you're saying, hefty monthly fees. 
but I, I don't know how much is in the sinking fund, you know, for like that's it. That's what repair, I mean. So like you need, to, fund and all that you need to find yeah. out how much is in the sinking fund mm -hmm. and also the history and plans of what they have been using it for or what, and what they're planning to use it for. Um, and then how, and then what, what things they've got scheduled in the future and what is the budget for that and what's going to likely, how, how much the owners are going to have to put in their pocket to cover those. Yeah. If they have that. So if they don't have a renovation plan or a maintenance plan for the next 10 years, that's not necessarily mismanagement. It just might mean that they've recently done stuff. So there's nothing urgent that needs to be done. So they haven't actually made a plan yet. So that's do okay. Have, do you have those terms in Japanese somewhere on your website or that you, that, um, this is something that I'll have to hire you to do to... To, to give me not that. on our website but i have i have been sending them back and forth via email to some people so i'll dig it's them up for you um, uh, chalky shoes and k kaka yeah i'm not gonna write that down i need you have a, such a good like memory for all of these like you know standard yeah he's amazing you know, well, like well, that, five five kanji jukugo like you know i well, don't I, know those words off the top of my head Mm. Yeah, you know, so, so just it, that, that's an easy one, right? Because chalky means long term, okay? <laughs> Shuzen is repair and keikaku is plan. So long term repair plan. It's basically the English direct translation, so it's not, nothing weird. You sound like my but son I, now. Like, Dad, this kanji yeah. is so easy. It's so easy, yeah. you know? It's yeah. like, yeah, it's a bot. <laughs> but, <laughs> no. but, but, so I, I don't know how it is with the small investments that, that, that you work with, but what I, for some home loans, home mortgages, the bank won't give you finance if the, the building does not have a long-term repair plan. It would, it, um, it's not going to be, it's a, it's a cash price. It'll be a cash purchase. Oh, no, yeah. but, no, no, but, but what this also means is if the management company doesn't like, I, I it's almost standard for a well-managed company, a uh, well-managed um, uh, uh, property building. manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well-managed, and maybe you're, Again, maybe some of the properties you're, look, you're looking at, they're smaller and they're more regional. But in Tokyo, when you know, prices are between like half a million to a million dollars for, for mansions that people are buying, uh, are buying um, and this is something you expect, if they don't have the long-term plan, then that's a, quite a negative idea. It's like, wow, well, okay, are you, I want, are you guys going to manage it? Um, and how well is it going to be managed? And do the owner, are in the owners even in agreement? Um, oh, he's going. He's going again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's going again. Oh my goodness! <laughs> the phone must be ringing. So anyway, I don't think he's he's realizing that what we're talking about is are these um, uh, <laughs> these ski resorts, and that's something that's going to be nice and clickbaity for you for your for this uh, for this episode because that's. Yep. Um, you know, because uh, the prices that I'm looking at for a two bedroom or a three bedroom apartment, we're looking at under ten thousand dollars. Yep, yep. That's because the people that own it don't want to keep paying four hundred bucks a month if they're not using it, right? But as long as I don't have to keep, as long as I don't have to pay any back in arrears, then that's what would be good. So actually, Emil, sorry about that. That's all right. Um, what what we're talking about are, are these under ten thousand uh, dollars apartments, two LDK, uh, three yeah. LDK, that are in ski resorts with a fairly hefty candy. Um, and like I said to Ziv just before, he can actually use this as a clickbaity thing for him for this video. Okay. <laughs> because it's, under ten thousand, that sounds like Matt's uh, one dollar properties. In the one dollar property, no, yeah. but I mean they're out there, and I know people who have them, and they're quite happy with their purchase because it's a lifestyle thing. They're able to go and use it on weekends, and they're able to keep their ski stuff there. And and um and and I'm what I'm looking at is like maybe I'm buying in a building where I've got a couple of friends who also have places in there, so. We can go away together, um, and it's still cheaper than even booking a, you know, um, a booking a villa up in like Hokkaido once a year, and it's yeah. your own place. So yeah. that's always sits well. Yeah. So the, the thing is with the uh, with the monthly the reserve funds and the um, the renovation history and the renovation plan. Um, if the reserve fund is completely depleted and nothing recent was done and nothing, you know you know, yeah. immediate upcoming, that means that they'll definitely have to jack up fees when they do need to do it. Um, so that 400 could suddenly turn into 600. That's one thing. Or it'll be like a once-off, like, 
did yeah. like we need oh, everyone pay two thousand bucks right now kind everyone of everyone pays two thousand bucks right now. yeah exactly so yeah. we want to avoid that and the other thing is that even if you're because some of these resorts are actually based around like a central building with facilities and then little villas all around mm. them right like with on their own little land plots mm -hmm. so in those cases even though there's not you know, there's not there's no structural maintenance taken out of the reserve fund to to cater for your own villa. Still, you want people to be able to use the main facilities if they suddenly and we have had buildings where, you know, they have a sauna, they have a spa, they have all of these things like a, a gym, but they're slowly just closing it off and stopping giving people access to them because they just don't have the funds to keep maintaining them. Right. So but you would be able to do the due diligence. So have you, you've done a few of these before, right? Oh, yeah, that, that, that's part and parcel of every uh, every resort condo or resort uh, uh, or, or normal condo that we facilitate, yeah. Nice. All right. Well, I'll talk to you a bit yeah. about, more about that offline. So I, I want to add to that bit about it because it, it's relevant for people looking at this, this part of the general due diligence um, for any kind of building uh, purchase. And maybe it's more it needs to be more thorough for your own personal property or the more expensive properties. And you can get away with not worrying so much if it's maybe just a cheaper investment. But the things that people should look at, that long-term management plan. So the main one is building maintenance, long-term building maintenance, the condition of the building, um, and the because the, you, you're paying for maintenance costs, right? And also the how the other owners are going to contribute right? Should there be a shortfall? And so how it works is a long-term maintenance, uh, the long-term building maintenance plan for, you know, building like most mansions that I, I sell will have, you know, like let's say 30, the next 35, 40 or 50 years. I'll say, every, and it's basically like an Excel sheet and it says from when the building was built up until for the next 50 years. So let's say it's a 15 year old building. We'll still show the next 30 years or so, 35 years. This year we're doing all the pipe cleaning. This is the expected budget. Next year, this is um, we're doing the we're going to redo the the, the, the lobby, the entrance, yeah. the entrance lobby. Yeah, oh, just it's in, just uh, ongoing uh, ordinary ongoing maintenance tasks, and every about ten to fifteen years is when they do the. Uh, um, it's a uh, it's called Daiki Boshuzam. It's a large scale repair and maintenance, and that's the one that costs several hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Um, like tens of millions of yen, and. That's where you see the scaffolding go up all around the building and they do all the big exterior work. It takes maybe, you know, six months to 12 months. Yeah. All the exterior sort of cleaning and maintenance, all the waterproofing, all that sort of stuff. And the mm -hmm. roof. That's, waterproofing, that's yeah. Yeah, and the wall, yeah. Exactly. And that, that's the big one. That's the big one. So even when clients are looking, because it's noisy and inconvenient for six to 12 months, that's the one that when you're looking at building and actually on the, when you're doing the purchase, it will actually say like important notes. There, there is in one or two years time where it's going to schedule the the large scale repair okay and you're like some people are like oh you know what i don't want to live through that i'm like it's a family home and i'm just having a baby I, I can't get a place and for the next 12 months it'd be noisy and on the flip side if it was just done two years ago they also advertise that the big repair was done two years ago so you know it's one it's sort of it's tidy and modern and clean and you're not going to have to worry about it for another decade that you're going to have to put up with that, with that noise. Um, but when you look at the, the chart that they have, it will actually say for each, each year what the budget is. And then based on the current repairs, like the, the current situation, this is the graph of the budget of the, 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 the pool of funds that they have based on the monthly um, contributions from all the managers. And often it'll say, you know, when you get a place that's 15 or 20 years old, I'll say, okay, this is where we are right now. And then, but we're not going to see meet the forecast moving forward. We need to adjust the price. This price option A, which is a 2,000 yen increase, price option B, which is a 4,000 increase, and price option C, um, which is like maybe 6,000 yen monthly increase, or the, the current go to. And you see the, the line drawn out on the graph versus actual budget required. And the owners will vote on option A, B, or C. Okay, or, or they may disagree and stay on the current path. And so sometimes we see a property and they'll actually say, the owners have agreed in the next three years, increase 1,000 yen and then five, another 500 yen, another 500 yen after that. So it's going to be up to 2,000 yen increase on the repair fund repayments over the next two years. That's really good. It means that owners have agreed 
to these changes. It's already been done. And the forecast rate means the sinking fund will have budget for the next 30 years. You're going to meet all the forecast stuff. That's why it's really important. Because what happens if you don't have enough money? There are two scenarios, um, or the three scenarios. One, let's say, you know, for maintenance, um, it needs to be done, but the, there's, the owners didn't vote, didn't agree, there's not enough savings. They can either get a bank loan. The building can, the owners need to agree to get a bank loan, and they'll borrow, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, or if it's elevator repair, something happens with elevator, often the re elevator repair company has, can, can, or can arrange the financing. And the building needs to borrow $400,000. And they say, okay, in addition to this, the, uh, like to make up for this, the owners need to pay this much extra, or they need to pay like every month, or they need to pay a lump sum of 300,000 yen each. Um, but if, and that's fine if the owners agree to it. So sometimes if there's a, on the, the building um, documents, if it says there's a, the building has a loan, and this is how much the owners are paying to pay off that mortgage anyway, uh, pay off that loan for the repair that needed to be done. That's actually, that's not a bad thing. It means all the owners are in agreement, they've got the repair done and they're paying for it. Uh, but what happens is if they don't come to agreement, um, the repair doesn't get done, it just, it becomes, it falls into a state of disrepair, okay? It, like I've had one building, it was a, a renovated, oh, sorry, it was an old mansion and it was on leased land. It was like 45 years old. And water was coming in through the windows. The person who owned the property was, they wanted to sell it. And, you know, water would come in through the windows, but they can't change the wind. They, they're not able to change the windows. The building management doesn't want to do stuff about it um, or because the owners don't want to agree to it because half the, own, half the building owners want to tear it down and repair uh, sorry, and rebuild. The other ones don't want to. Um, and there's just that conflict. And because it's on leased land, there's different, I think the lease to uh, holder as well does, uh, is starting to buy up a lot of these properties as well so they can tear it down. Um, th there's a lot going on, but when you just look at it, I went to visit it, and although it's nice, high view, the, the outside of the building was crap. The, the elevator was terrible. The hall hadn't been updated for so long. And because there's just disputes and disagreements, um, when you don't have, and they, that building did not have a long-term repair plan. Right, but when there is one in place, the building tends to be a lot tidier, a lot easier to to finance, a lot easier to resell, and just living there. Like you talk about lifestyle, Tracy. Like you know, it's you're buying it for the lifestyle and comfort of holiday. But when you have, repairs, yeah, when you have, when you have these management headaches, and it's not just you don't, you can't choose the repair. That's a problem. It's you have to come to an agreement with a bunch of other holiday owners who may not even live in the country. You don't really care right, that are doing it. And maybe they don't want to pay more. Or they, maybe they're not even paying the, the funds. We interrupt this broadcast. I always wanted to say this. We interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo, and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, or if you just need summer quiet to hide away from the world. So they offer a variety of options for families, for corporate relocations, or simply if you're transitioning between homes in Tokyo. Now, the properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really, the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They've got fast, unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in, a fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but long-term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, you definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profits or a holiday home that you want rented out when not in use via short-term stays, drop them a line today 
see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth your visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil is your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at emil.gorgies, G-O-R-G-E-E-S at tokyorealty.jp. Yeah, I'll add, um, just a couple of small caveats on that. Number one, um, depending on the building management company as well, the building management company. So the owner union will nominate and hire a building management company to take mm -hmm. care of all of these plans and renovations and recommendations and so forth. Some of the building management companies and some of even the uh, developers that build these from the get go, sometimes they have a policy um, like, for example, I think it was Daya, Daya Palace, I think, that we've worked with. Uh, we, we purchased properties by that um, developer and building management company a few times. They have a policy of leaving the monthly fees uh, as low as possible for as long as possible. So they actually, whenever there is a renovation that needs to be done, um, by default, they'll take a loan out. Like they want to leave the fees as low as possible for as long as possible for all the owners. And when it's time to renovate, they'll take a loan and then they'll raise but the fees. Money's so cheap though here though, right? Like, you know, when, you know, borrowing money is actually yeah. really, really cheap because the interest rates are so low. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not contesting the policy. It sounds a little bit risky to me because I mean, sure, that might cover you for the planned renovation, but then what happens if an earthquake hits and you suddenly no, no, double the amount that oh. you're, so I, I, but anyway, that that's their policy. So yeah. I just, just want to say that it's not necessarily a bad sign if the reserve fund is depleted, because sometimes it's just because the building fees have been left low for as long as possible. And the other thing is that um, you'll find that there's a bit of a difference between buildings where most of the units are investment size units yeah. and others are family sized units, which are usually going to be owned by owners occupiers. Mm -hmm. Um, investors, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing because most of our customers are the same. When investors buy a property and, you know, all of these studio 1R, one 1DK, one they're, they're never going to live in them. They're basically investment properties from the get-go. So when they buy one of these, they've in their mind already know that they're going to resell it after 10, 15 years, right? So they really don't have any long-term interest in keeping the building up to speed, you know? All they care about is minimizing their monthly fees and maximizing their yield. So we, on behalf of our clients, usually just vote for the lowest, for the lowest uh, uh, fee hike as possible because we're not thinking what happens in 20 years. We're thinking in five, seven years when we resell, we want the yield to be as high as possible because that's how these properties are priced based on yield, right? Whereas with owners, occupiers, they have a lot, they're going to be there for the long haul. And they're obviously enjoying the perks of a nice building. So they usually would have more interest in, in keeping things, you know, as beautiful and tidy and well, well maintained as possible. So yeah. it's a bit of a different mindset depending on the size of the property. So if you're looking at two, three, four LDK, then you're probably going to find that the buildings are normally better maintained than those tiny shoe boxes. Yeah. Oh, look, I was this, I used to go and spend a lot of time up at Onjuku in Chiba. And uh, in one of those apartments that was on the on the water there, and, and you know people we probably stayed up. at the same one. Sorry, we probably stayed at the same one. The probably. Sea Heights. Uh, yeah, the one with the really hideous orange like uh, lobby, and um, <laughs> yeah, I mean it was a really good location. It was great, and uh, some of those apartments were really good, and the prices were great. But you know. They, they, they were notorious for having really, you know, having zero sinking fund. And and they were, even along, I'm just looking at the outside, on the balconies, you could actually see rebar coming through, coming through. And I was like, well, you know, this doesn't actually feel so safe. What, you know, if this falls down, I've got, you know, zero land rights and I've got zero, you know, it's like I've just lost yeah. it. So, so yeah. in some cases also Japan being Japan, it doesn't happen that often or at least not as often as in other countries. But in some cases, there's actual mismanagement and embezzlement and th those things happen here as well. Yes, it make does. Of, if you see on the uh, building, um, like the annual meetings by the owner union, you might suddenly see, oh, we've replaced the management company three years ago because they weren't doing anything or they were pocketing some of the money and doing other things with it. And um, it's usually a good sign. It means that, they, you know, they've, 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 no, taken, they've yeah. taken action. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. Um, but, I, I, just quickly, um, so 
the point that you made before about you know difference between owner occupiers so properties that are largely owner occupied so two ldk three ldk um where most of the mansion is owned by uh, owned by the is resided by the owners then yeah they because they live there they tend to spend more on the maintenance and they're happy to do that whereas the investment side of it the smaller places they not they want to keep the management fees low um and because it's purely a, a roi um so for investors that's that's one way of looking at it i i look at it exactly the the other side of the same coin is i tell people when we're looking i go this is la- largely um owner occupied like we take with the the uh, management company that's an attractive sales point absolutely because when people are buying it they're like you know they want to buy for you know they want to live there and so they're comfortable knowing that everyone else is going to care about the building right so it's it's also the sale the same sales um uh like uh a, a positive sales item mm. is when it is largely owner occupied and we look at actually look look at the buildings if if someone wants a 3 ldk and they find a place it's the penthouse of the building 3 ldk and every other build every other apartment is a one bedroom small one bedroom i tell them look you, you want to live here with your <laughs> yeah well well you got you want to live here with your family right um and you have like let's think of two two types of buildings one where everyone is a one ldk and you're the only person with a three bedroom family home family apartment the kind of people living in that building are different to hey this entire building is all 2 and 3 ldk that's a very good point It's as mostly well mostly families the neighbors are totally different right yeah yeah exactly right the people in so and you kind of get to know your neighbors get to know the community um so that's relevant in mansions so you want to see like if you're buying the biggest mansion if the biggest you know uh, apartment in the whole building that may not really like the culture and the style of people that are there may be a bit of a mismatch um or like if it's just a little bit bigger 70 50 square meters and then 65 and you're still a single person and yeah that makes sense um but when it's a really a massive change well that's something you need to keep in mind um and the same goes for uh the some prop like houses sometimes you see a beautiful house and it's a nice big house on its own but all the the neighboring properties it's like these are just old apartment wooden apartment and it's like you know maybe the rent is 45,000 yen for each apartment and it's just a little one room so it's like hold on this whole street is people that are not families mm. whereas often we go look it's not like it's it's eight new houses being developed every person buying this house is going to be a young family just like yourself mm. right or if it's like you know that entire street so that's something we also look at and depending on the kind of client um you know that that's that's a really really important point they may want like that thing where they're just individual and they don't they don't want to be amongst kids and families um they're the you know single couple or just single person versus you know someone with a family they want the whole entire family family environment so that's very something that we uh I pay close attention to most of my clients and families So I always let them know when I'm like what I sort of spot out like oh that's an apartment over there that's an apartment this is an apartment and there are no other houses in the area I'm like mm, I don't I'm not getting a good vibe from yeah. the no, area Tracy, I, that's something that your your customers need to take into consideration too I guess right like if somebody's thinking about setting up a minpa cooperation even if the city ward says it's okay in this area but everywhere around them is like family homes they're going to have some trouble aren't they Well yes um but usually if it's pure residential if it's like res a residential a you won't get the the minpaku license anyway um yeah. and uh i mean you know but in my street i've got all family homes in my street and i have a hotel license but i'm on a commercial we're on a commercial zone um but my neighbors are really cool so <laughs> they're all really cool so um and um they you know they're totally fine because they know me you know i'm like i don't just come in you know bring any old yahoo into the area i'm like a really strict host it's like not all mimpaku is built hosts are built the same yeah. um and so you know you can have a you know you can have a really really bad airbnb host who's who's vacant and doesn't doesn't look after their guests um very well and then the guests are just running a muck um or you have you know hands on hosts like me who are who are also in it for the long run. I live in the area so it's it's like I I want I want the best as well. Mm. Yeah, one one thing like 
But if, if someone's looking to just buy, like there was a question on Facebook, on the Japan Real Estate Facebook group as well recently about if I want to buy a whole building, right? I'm looking for an agent. Someone said, I'm looking for an agent to buy an entire building to use for Minpaku or a hotel. Um, you know, like, yes, if it's in a residential area, if it's in the right zoning, you can technically build it and you can turn it into a hotel and you've got to be more cautious. To Did you tag to me in that post? I, I didn't see, you know. Uh, we did tag you, actually, I think. Did I respond? Um, I don't think you did, no. Yeah. So anyway, okay. go on, Emil. But, but in terms of, that, but, you know, but if someone's looking, like, if someone's looking for a hotel, basically, if it's like an old house to turn into a hotel or a block of land to build a hotel, if there are two options and they're the same price, one, like, one is in the, like, down some residential area amongst a bunch of houses, like, technically you can do it, versus one is like on the short end guy, right? Just amongst a bunch of, you're like straight away, yep, yeah, this is great. I'm going to have no headache from the neighbors, right? This is going to be so crazy. So, Yes, you can get away with it. And yeah, you can pull it off and do it. And it's a bit, you know, you got to be a little bit more cautious and of the neighbors and, and uh, considerate of the environment. But wow, if you find one on the show thing, guy, that's like oh, almost a free pass because you're like, yeah, that this is so good. So, um, yeah, I would, I'd, I'd it, love to have a place on a show thing, guy. Yeah. It'd be awesome. Yeah, and and be and because like it's easy access. Just for our listeners like, um, who are not familiar with the term, can you explain right. what a shopping guy is? Uh, so shopping guy, so um, is the shopping street. So often when you get out of the station, there'll be just a, like a few strips coming out of the station, um, and you just walk down, and there's like super, uh, convenience stores and and dry cleaners and dentists all along either side of of it, um, and that's like basically commercial sort of zoning area. Um, and they, they sort of sc uh, scatter out as you get away from the station. But, um, yeah, ha having a house on that or a hotel or a short-term stay property on one of those areas, because there's so much foot traffic, uh, neighbours, there's no immediate, like, neighbours, kids don't really play on the street, neighbours don't really, cars don't really drive up and down there so much. It's not so quiet. It's expected to be noisy. There's restaurants. So you're not going to have issues about neighbours complaining about people dragging their suitcases or it's too noisy, etc. Or who are all these strange people walking up and down? You know, if it's around the shopping street, any that's like an open, you know, shopping area for anyone to come and go. So it's a great, you know, or just straight off that, really easy. That a place where it's not going to disturb neighbors, being like ordinary families. That's that's the ticket. So when someone in that Facebook group was saying, you know, they're looking to buy a place that they can do for short term stay, um, or min, get a min paku Airbnb type license. I said to them, I, my, my response in that post was, you should be getting a property that you can get a hotel license for. Um, and it's not like what's the cheapest one that I can get the max ROI, because there's always that thing of what's ROI versus management, maintenance, and headache. And if it's, you know, Tracy can tell you, like, buy, if you get it, you said you'd love it. If someone has it, you know, even 10 minutes from the station, but if it's on a short end guy, on a strip where there's not going to be any trouble with the neighbors. Often it's easy access from the station. The map is going to be one straight road or maybe one right turn. And you're right there. You don't have to go and help look for, like help lost, <laughs> lost uh, people find their way. Um, that that's, that's the comfortable, easy one that I think is worth paying a premium for. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to have a really well run operation. Yeah. Look, I, I, I had one client who was building, was in the process of building a, I was helping him build a uh, like capsule hotel and a short end guy. And he had the building and he was doing all the renos and, you know, the builders were in there and they'd like gutted everything. And then the pandemic hit and it was just like, oh my goodness. Oh, no. so, oh, speaking of that, Tracy, are you, now that we're slowly opening up to more business travelers and students, are you seeing any uptake? I got three new bookings today. Yes. First, you know, I was very, I'm very, very upbeat because I've got three new bookings. Well, there's actually three, not, well, it was one yesterday and two today that um, brand new, they're not, for the next you know minute but uh um yeah people are people are booking again i'm very excited um i have my clients who are actually due to arrive in march they actually have a confirmed arrival date of the 3rd of april so they're in so these are people that have booked me with me before um and um they're they're coming in but i still have vacancies so yeah no no i'm sure you do but i'm, I'm wondering if things are slightly improving 
I, look at my face. Look at my face, dude. <laughs> look at my face. I'm, uh, I'm much, much happier. Um, but, uh, like, Emil, I had another follow-up question before from the first round before you had to drop off. Um, mm -hmm. If somebody is looking keep, for... Keep talking. Keep talking. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, just, uh, I just... Somebody, I just, I just, I just <laughs> okay. Let's say Please. somebody yeah. is... Uh, so somebody is changing jobs and they've up until up until a certain point have been self-employed or freelance or whatever they've then taken a job with a big corporate with a big name and a like fancy you know how long does it take for the bank to recognize like to yeah, you know to, to see, them as a, see them as a as a good like candidate to consider the employment it depends on the bank, depends on the situation, but the shortest you get is one pay slip. One pay slip. So, so yeah. if you then go and work for like, you know, like you go and work for Coca Cola, or like you go from being freelance, from being a, you know, not saying me, but someone like me who's like been, you know, been running yeah. their own business, self employed. If I go and get a job tomorrow at a corporate, that has a big name. I just have to go one pay slip, and they and they see me as completely different animal. Is that right? Yeah, that's a certain type of bank with a certain type of loan. So yes, but um, you mean you need to meet a few other criteria. So the shortest will be one month. Realistically, um, they often work. there's a thing in Japan called shiokikam. So um, when you it's a uh, probation period. Right. So in Japan, yep. yeah, in Japan, often the probation period is three months, maybe six months. Okay. So, um, so, and the probation period for listeners is when it's easy for the company to to cancel your contract or to fire you, right? Um, but apart, outside of that, it becomes very hard for permanent employees to get fired for companies to to let them go in Japan, right? So Surely that would be on your employment contract, like if yeah, some people yes. would get employed without without that three months. Oh, yeah. so actually, um, you in, got general, in an executive level. No, no. So, so it it can be two or three ways. Um, they can say the employment period is three months, or the oh, sorry, the the probation period is three months. Probation period is six months. Or they say the, there's the it can specify that there is no probation period, or there is nothing discussed about probation period at all. My understanding is if there's nothing mentioned about probation period, then the standard is three months, right? Even if it's not explicitly stated, then three months is how it is, is what the like Ministry of Affairs, or, uh, what's it, um, Ministry of Labor will kind of consider it. Is my, what I've heard, I don't know about it. But again, well, we're just talking a few months, right? So let's, rather than nitpicking about, ooh, this or that, let's say three months. Right? So, this is how so the bank will look like at what it. I'm saying, it's not, it's not two years worth of, no, no, no. With financials is not. No. It's like it's it's no, fairly so it's, fairly well, quick. Was, yeah, yeah, yes and no. So it, it does vary on case by case. But if you're looking just at the employment, some if you meet some other criteria, it can be one month. If you otherwise, it will be some bank will work just one month after the end of the probation period. So just say it's a three month probation period. Your fourth paycheck. So it'll be the twenty. Often salary is paid on the 25th of every month in Japan. So the 25th of the fourth month, when you have that payslip, that's when they'll accept your application. Some other banks are three months after the end of your probation period. So if you're on a three-month probation period, then it's on the six-month payslip. If it's on a six-month probation period, then it's on the nine-month payslip. Um, there, there's a bunch of factors. and But de depending on your individual situation, you may or may not be eligible to apply for the one month version bank or the three month bank or the, the six month bank. You may have to do it for the later one. Mm. And there are some banks that you you can do it right away, but if you've been there for under two years, they don't tell you, but they will recalculate your borrowing capacity a little bit lower. Right, right? and that, no, that, that, goes, that goes for refinancing too. So for example. Like, Maybe your interest rate a little bit higher too. Um, right? Right? Uh, so, sometimes like, you know, like they'll say it'll either be like, they don't play with the interest rate so much. Maybe sometimes a little bit. And look, I'm, I'm speaking specifically for home loans, your own personal home loan, investment loans I'm not too sure about. Um, but when they analyze the, 
the interest rate, um, there could be a 0.2% decrease. It's like the super low risk person, which is like 0. You know, four five percent, or the not super low risk person, which is zero point six five percent, right? Um, it'll, it'll be like e either of those kind of two triggers. Uh, so yes, you can do it, you can get it, um, but it depends on the the bank and your other situation. Your other situation. If you have permanent residency, um, and the employer you are going with is a listed company, it's a large company. Okay, like so Sony is my example of a typical big, large Japanese company, right? You get a job at Sony. Google, Google Amazon, Sony whatever, employer. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, any, any listed company, right? Mm. Uh, um, and then in terms of your age as well, um, how look at it, how much you want to borrow, what your existing debt is. Uh, and then also stuff like, to be honest, like your, your family situation. A single guy in his, you know, 20s, they're going to say, uh, like in, if they don't have permanent residency, you just change. Oh, look, you know, we can give you the loan, but we want you to pay twenty percent deposit because you can just if you get a good, better job in Singapore, you can just leave. Mm. Versus any of us married with kids in the system, yeah, right. Like oh yeah, we, we don't have the same kind of flexibility, um, but same kind of like you know uh, yeah flexibility to just jump ship. So they know okay yeah the chance of this guy just getting a better job and <laughs> picking up his old family on a whim next week. You know, we do that in our twenties. We don't do that in our you know thirties and forties and fifties. Uh, so, hmm. yeah, and especially we got kids or not, if you're married or not. So they they do look at that um, as well. So yeah, it, it's a bit of a case by case kind of hmm. situation. But if you have permanent residency um, and you get a job with a company, yeah, look, say three, like yeah, anywhere from there, three, three to six months is. Hmm. We can realistically look at it. And if, but like my clients will, you know, when I do my, most of my clients, like, you know, they'll reach out either through, through, you know, they'll, they'll see this or they hear this podcast or they'll see the video, the blog, or they see me on Facebook or it's a referral. They'll send me an email and say, Emil, look, you know, I'm, I want to talk. I'm interested in buying. Can we discuss my situation? And I'll schedule like a one hour phone call. It usually it ends up being one hour to 90 minutes and discuss really the specific situation and their requirements and, from that, it's like, okay, based on what you're telling me, I kind of feel these banks would be the best ones. But everyone's always a unique kind of case. So I'll get their data, their information, and then I'll just call our banks because we have the loan officers assigned to our agency. We're a typical Japanese agency. Um, and so I'll call, you know, Mizuho, MUFJ, Rizona, and SMBC. and say, this is the client that I've got. This is their situation. They just changed jobs. This is their new company. This is their current income. This is what they were doing before. They've been employed for two months. What can we do? What can we expect? And how long do you want? And I'll say, ah, oh, okay, maybe we want them to be, you know, six months in the company. I'll be like, well, actually, no, this person looks pretty solid. They went from one listed company to another listed company, okay, with no break in between. The income's pretty much similar or everything, all the story makes sense. They have permanent residency. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, that, this person can apply right away. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, we get that feedback and I find the bank, which will do the best financing deal and the most easiest and the soonest for the client. But also keep in mind, it generally takes, you know, the search takes about three months at least once you're active and engaged to find the right one. Mm -hmm. So you don't really need the one that's on month day one, month one. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, no, thank you for that. No, that's, um, uh, there's some, uh, yeah. There's we can some talk separately. Some but I, there's some people doing some interesting things lately. I think, um, you know, with the, business people still being locked out. And I think a lot of Jap like like long termers are making some interesting career choices while they while they can. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's definitely I mean that's you know not just uh you know if people in the this podcast are listening in Japan, there are some, you know, if you've been thinking about taking a job, um there's a lot of like now is a really good time because uh they're hungry for talent. They can't bring people in. They can't bring people in. They're hungry for talent. And then there's all these additional benefits, like Emil has just said, about your buy borrowing capacity. If you're really keen on, like, setting down roots here, then now is, like, you, you know, once in a lifetime, well, think, hopefully, once in a lifetime opportunity to do I think that. we had enough of this. <laughs> no, I think we've all had enough of this. If so, you, yeah, look, if, but one more thing, like, if you're considering buying a house and changing job, Let's jump on the uh, the um, 
Like, buy a house first? Well, or buy, buy a house first, yeah. But buy the house first before changing your job. What about, no, um, but what, what about if you're working as a freelancer and you don't, like... You, oh, you no, know. I, I, no, 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 because uh, that, that's not changing job, right? That's that's getting a job. But if you're a, a salaried employee right now right. and you've been in the same company for 12 years... Yeah, now years, is the time years, to get the house, And then you're right? like, yeah, you're like, oh, my wife's pregnant. I'm, I'm well, we're going to get married. going to think, oh, hey, you know, I'm also... Let me start... I want to buy a house, but also let me consider a career change. And I'm like, well, yeah, okay, let's buy yeah, the house no, I first. See, I, can I get see the that. Yeah. I totally, I totally see that. But I'm just saying yeah. is, you know, there's a lot of people who have been like free, doing freelance teaching, freelance, yes, yes. whatever. If they go and then get a corporate job or a university job, which they can, do that. you know, you know, do that first, and then you'll be able to have more uh, buying, you know, uh, real estate yeah. opportunities. All yeah. right. That's a good note to end on. I think it oh, is. oh, but Tracy, um, before we go, could you all of those um, cheap ass um, ski resort properties that you're looking at? Could you just send me a copy of those links? I got a customer looking for exactly that at the moment. No problem. I can do that. I can do that. Looking at and, a th looking at a three LDK for um, for under ten thousand dollars. I'm like, mm, mm, yeah. uh, tempting. I, I before we wrap up, can you tell us about your new company, please? <gasps> yes. Yes. Oh, so yes, you post goodness. something yes. and I'm like, hey. <laughs> yes. Good stuff. I'll yep, hear about yep. this. So the company is called Nippon Bridge. Uh, maybe in the future it'll be part of the Nippon Group, but at the moment it's a separate company. And so, what, is, that, is that a, in Japanese? Is it Nihonbashi? Yeah, so no, we're specifically not calling it uh, anything in Japanese. It's Nippon Bridge. <laughs> oh, stop it, Emil. See, look, if you don't three speak kids, Japanese... Three kids. <laughs> oh, no, that, that Sami, Sami. Hmm. And what we're doing is uh, at the moment we're, we're um, two-pronged. So one side is, I think I might have mentioned here on the podcast once or twice, uh, what we're going to do is same as we're doing with real estate, we're going to help uh, foreign investors uh, buy into Japanese franchise businesses. So your curry shops, your bento box places, hotomoto, or um, after school. Uh, Coin laundries? Um, laundries is something we're definitely looking at. So what we do is basically, if, we have a few case studies that we're already acting on, but if somebody has a particular interest in a particular kind of business, uh, we're definitely happy to search for franchises who would consider foreign investors. So many good franchises here. Yes. I've got friends who are yes. doing like- And they're not, they just they're not, don't know how to work with foreign yeah. investors. So we're very happy to uh, help them with that. So many good franchises. Yeah, like a friend of mine, yeah. they, they, bought a, they bought into a cleaning franchise, and, you know, Cleaning franchise business. Cleaning are a big one, yeah. Clean, well, the, cleaning air conditioners. And it's just, it's a, you know, it's great. It's a, the, the support from the franchise, you know, head, head office is, is outstanding. Yes. So mm -hmm. for anybody who's interested in investing in a business, this is pro obviously investing in a business is a bit, or, a bit of a higher risk than investing in like um, rental real estate, for example. But as businesses go, working with a franchise is a much lower risk factor because they've got the blueprint, they've done it successfully, they hold your hand throughout the process, tell you how to hire, they do the training of the staff for you, everything. And the other advantage of that is that it is much, much easier to get a business visa for somebody who's seeking to relocate to Japan because to get a business visa via property investment, you need to have some pretty hefty property uh, assets, right? Yeah. Um, and these are cheap. They're cheap to get into the, for the price of a property, right? A cheap property, $100,000, $200,000, $300,000. Um, you can have a business up and running and, and um, uh, guarantee yourself a business visa in the process. And the other prong of the business is affordable relocation services. So there are obviously uh, quite a few companies doing relocation services, assisting people who are coming to Japan in, uh, with housing, opening a bank account, uh, registering kids for school, signing up for utilities and so forth, but they cost a fortune. They cost about 600 bucks a day at a minimum for a day of support. Well, they get at corporates though. They're bed geared at yes, the big yes, multinationals. Exactly. So what so about what, the average small to medium business? Exactly. Yeah. So what we're planning to do is to start offering the service to people who actually need it, but can't afford it. So university, faculty, maybe international mm. students, English teachers, uh, we believe we can do that for at least half that price. Um, so that's what mm. we're going to be doing. Those two things. And, and it, just in Fukuoka or, or countrywide? The relocation service, because it requires a lot of handholding, like physical attendance, we're going to start it, uh, not just Fukuoka, but Kyushu. 
So anywhere in Kyushu, there's a lot of people relocating to Kitakyushu, to Kumamoto, to Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. um, but once we've got, um, you know, the expertise and a few clients under our belt, we're definitely planning to do it Japan-wide as well. Yeah, via outsourcing or, or any branch office or so, so, so. Oh, look, I've done, I've, pick me, I, I've done training. Uh -huh. I've yeah. trained, I've, I've actually been the trainer on a lot of those inbounds before and done the cross-cultural training, so... Yep, so if we need work done in and around Tokyo, you can definitely do that, right? Count me in. Here you go. Yep, giddy up, man. Cool, so yeah, the uh, franchise good. business is already going. We've got two customers who are already in the process of establishing their first uh, franchisee mm -hmm. uh, operation. The relocation business, we're uh, it's established, but there's not too many people relocating still. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so the infrastructure is in place, but we still need the borders to open a little bit more for that. All righty, that sounds great. Congrats, Fantastic. Congratulations. Well, if Thank I hear you. people... So there's going to be a new podcast, a new YouTube channel, a lot of articles coming out. Everything that you've seen on the Japan real estate front is going to be um, replicated on the uh, Nippon Bridge front as well. Oh, that's awesome. Nippon Bridge. Nihonbashi. That's... Uh, to, to <laughs> all day. I'm going to be bothered by that all day now, Emil. <laughs> well, that's my intention. Make people uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have Good a wonderful, speak with you again, wonderful folks. day. See you again very, very soon. Done, man. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 All right, so there you have it, Nippon Bridge, a new company is off, really exciting stuff. Um, feel free to reach out if you want to find out more. As mentioned, the website, social media channels, podcast or podcasts and YouTube channel or channels all coming soon. And of course, if you have any questions about the other topics we were discussing there as well, don't be shy, drop us a line. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company, and you've got any sort of business or visa-related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku. Bye.